to you, O Christ. I have found that curiosity is a great posture to bring to our engagement with God's Word that we find in Scripture the things that we wonder about, the questions that we have as we read. Today we hear the story, this uh, Gospel of Mark, early on in the Gospel where Jesus is teaching with authority. This man with an unclean spirit shows up. He casts out that spirit. The people are all astonished and in awe. Now I found uh, my curiosity drawn to two parts of this story. First is the authority. Jesus does not have political power, he doesn't have economic power, he doesn't have any uh, of that sort of uh, might and uh, presence that you would expect would give him like official authority, but he walks into the synagogue and right away has authority. So what's that all about is something that I'm curious about. The second part then is what's going on with this man with the unclean spirit? And I think actually the answer to the second question might give us a little bit of uh, some insight into at least part of what gives Jesus authority for those people that are with him. Let's start then with that second piece, the man with an unclean spirit. And we can start also then, uh, before we get too curious, uh, we could just start with what the story sort of sets out before us. One of the things we can notice is that the man does not have a name. It doesn't tell us that Paul or Jonah came in and had an unclean spirit. It just tells us a man with an unclean spirit. So we might kind of gather that he has a label, right? People could look at him and say, that's the guy with the unclean spirit. The second thing we see in the story is that the spirit speaks. It influences the behavior. And the fact that Jesus can cast it out tells us that it comes from outside of him. So he's got a label, but he also has this outside power that is uh, within him then that has an ability to impact his at least speaking, but presumably his behaving. The third part then is that the spirit is not easily excised out of him. It goes kicking and screaming, if you will, with convulsing and, and all that goes with that. So he's got a label. There's this outside power that has a hold on him. And that power is hard to get disentangled from him as a human being. That's in the story. But where curiosity can then take us is to try to imagine more deeply what the story isn't necessarily telling us, but might have been happening at the same time. The story tells us that just then there was a man with an unclean spirit. So I want you to take a moment and just to kind of imagine that we're in a room in the first century. This new teacher, Jesus, has come in and he is really engaging and so maybe like our kids, we all have those faces of curiosity and attentive listening. And then all of a sudden, the man with the unclean spirit walks in. And we all know who he is, right? And so there's probably some of us that elbow our neighbor and just kind of point knowingly that this is that guy that's really disruptive and something's probably now going to disrupt this whole thing. Some probably went beyond just the elbow and the look and whispered to their neighbor, here we go, right? Like, pay attention, there's the guy again. I would bet that someone had a bag and grabbed that bag a little more tightly because you know you can't trust those people with unclean spirits. I would bet someone else had a cloak and maybe an empty spot next to them on the floor and they just moved the cloak over there to make sure that he didn't come sit by them because they didn't want to be close to him either. Probably when he came through the door, there were some people who moved out of the way to make room for him because they didn't want to get associated with him or be too close to him. At a minimum, I would bet lots of people just cast those kind of judging glances at him as he came into the room. Now, of course, all of this is some imagination, right? But when a man with the unclean spirit walks into this great gathering that's happening, you can bet that kind of stuff happened. We also then might try to imagine how it felt for him. And there I have a question, did he know he had an unclean spirit? Let's assume that he did know, that he had this force that was causing him to act and do things that he didn't want to do, that he knew he was in there and that he knew that no one else could see him anymore. They only saw that unclean spirit or the acts that that unclean spirit carried him into. He had to be cast off, lonely, struggling, suffering, and just deeply needing to be seen. I do think that even the hardest, toughest people have a deep need to be known and loved for who they are underneath whatever exterior layers we have. 
And so as he walked into that place, he probably just had maybe this longing to be seen and known for who he was, not the labels and not that external power and not the difficulty he had in trying to get rid of that. Alternatively, maybe he didn't know he had an unclean spirit. And maybe he came in combative, right? He knows what he knows and everybody else is judging him and who are you to judge me? You all are just as bad as I am. And maybe he had all sorts of, of sense that he was being wrongly judged and that those people were the ones who were wrong. And he had every right to be there as everybody else and to talk to Jesus in the way he was going to talk to Jesus. Equally lonely, perhaps. Equally cast off, but with a different spirit. And and maybe it's somewhere in between those extremes that he came into that room, right? But he certainly was not connected into that community in a way that was healthy for him and allowed him to thrive and be the human being he was beyond the labels and beyond that outside force and beyond the struggle he had to separate himself from that unclean spirit. So now we've right, taken some bits we see in the story and we've imagined a little bit, but we don't have to really imagine that hard to see that this kind of stuff happens around us all the time. Now whether there's a demon in there that gets cast out or simply the sort of external thing that comes with labels and these powers that can shape our behaviors and then be hard to disconnect ourselves from, it happens. I've been blessed a couple of times to visit Haiti. And in both visits, we spent time with some young men who had been child slaves. Little kids, they had been sent off to be with some other family for uh, a variety of reasons, driven by poverty and brokenness. And in those homes then, they become slaves that do all the work but get no love in return, right? And so they had a label. They call them Restivex. Now, that's the label for a child slave. But when we talked to these young men, they would tell us that they were told that they were garbage. They were told that they were worthless. And they were treated like that. Now you can imagine that if you're a little kid and every day you get treated as if you are garbage and told that you are garbage and no one gives you any sense that you have any value, that sooner or later you begin to believe that. So you've got a label, you're a restivec, you're, you're worthless, you're garbage, but then you also have this outside force that begins to shape your inside person to where you have a spirit that doesn't really reflect the beloved child of God you were created to be, but instead reflects the brokenness that has been laid upon you. How easy then is it to get disconnected from that external spirit that is so conditioned you believe that's where you are? Now in particular, these young men lived in a place called St. Joseph's House, and they had been shaped together as a family. And every afternoon in chapel, they went through an exercise that we call bravos or affirmations, where they would start when one would say something uh, positive uh, about one of their uh, friends, neighbors, family members there, and then two more people would, and they would go around the circle until every person that had three positive things said about them. It was an exercise in trying to excise all of what they had been taught and the ways that they had been treated that convinced them they were garbage and tried to convince them that they indeed were not. That may be an extreme example, but if we look around in our lives, some of you have experienced being labeled whatever that label might be, walking into a room and being the only person who's different from the others and then receiving that label and knowing that there's expectations about how you're going to behave and maybe you're suspicious and maybe people are clutching their purses and doing all those sorts of behaviors that we have when people are suspicious. In this time of pandemic, right, you don't have to look far. We've become suspicious of one another and our public behaviors and so you can see this more readily, but some of you experienced it long before that, right? This need to be seen for who you are, not for the labels and the external things that you have been saddled with and the struggles that you have had to try to get out from under those burdens. Maybe it's easier in trying to figure out uh, where we have suffered to think about, or harder really, to think about the ways that we have been the ones who gave the elbows and the knowing glances. When have you looked at someone and maybe rolled up the car window because you thought maybe they weren't safe because there they are panhandling on the street? Or maybe you've heard an accent and it made you uncomfortable and so you've distanced yourself from that person that's different from you. Maybe you saw someone coming on the street and you walked to the other side because your just instinct was that person who's different from me isn't safe. All of those things contribute to these spirits that we create in our world that can inhabit people and convince them or shape them to behave in certain ways because of all of the prejudice and stuff that we carry with us. 
So what happened to that man with the unclean spirit, right? The, we see it around us in much more ordinary ways all the time, in the ways that we judge others, in the ways maybe that we feel judged. Which brings us back to Jesus. Jesus comes into that space, he's teaching, and then this unclean spirit shows up in this man, and Jesus sees. Jesus sees him past the label. He sees him past that external spirit. He sees past the difficulty the man has with that spirit, and Jesus casts it out. And you can bet that that man, then right in that moment, that Jesus had authority for him. Because Jesus saw him, right? Deeply saw the beloved child of God that he was and freed him from the thing that was burdening him and weighing on him and impacting his life in such negative ways. So Jesus has authority then with him. But in the story, Jesus has authority before that ever happens. It just tells us he's teaching in the synagogue and he has authority. And there's probably lots of reasons for that. But I would suggest today that perhaps the reason in part that he did was because he saw each and every one of those people there. Saw past their labels, saw past their prejudices, saw past their knowing elbows and glances and whisperings, saw past the clutching of purses and the moving of cloaks, saw past all of their brokenness and judgment to see who they were as people. And in his teaching and in his preaching in that space, my guess is that each of them felt seen and heard that they could look at Jesus and say, this guy really understands who I am and what my struggles are and what my suffering is. And when we are truly seen and heard by someone, perhaps then they have authority. Not because they have a title or power or wealth, but because they have connected into the depths of our humanity. If we pay attention to Jesus, he does this all the time as he walks through the world. He sees those that are hurting, but he also sees past the brokenness of those who are in power. Those that would trip him in questions, right? He sees through all of it and sees who they are as people. Not just the hard parts, but the blessing. He sees through the cross. He sees through death all the way into spaces of new life. That's what allows Jesus to take that journey so then he can gift us with this gift of life. He then, right after the resurrection, ascends into heaven and leaves us here. So what are we stuck with now? Well, we are the church, the body of Christ, and Jesus has given us this command to sort of live out, love the world, and carry really his same authority. But we don't just get the authority, right? We have to kind of earn it in a way. When we go out into the world, really a way to approach it is the same way we can come at Scripture, with curiosity, as we run into people, to be curious about them, to see past the labels, past those external struggles, past the things that they struggle to get out from under, and to really see people as human beings. We won't always get that right, but when we do, when we hear people, hear their stories, hear their struggles, and they know they have been seen, we will have authority. And it's not that we have power. It's that the gospel working through us then has an opportunity to shape and transform their lives. As we do that, we will always carry our own prejudices. I remember early in my corporate career, I was in a big workshop and a woman was talking about the ways that prejudice impacts our behavior. And the facts that our prejudices are shaped by the families we grow up in and the communities that we grow up in and that they get sort of deeply baked into us. And she was really vulnerable. She shared a story about a time where she was walking down the street and an a African-American man was coming the other way and she said her instinct was to just clutch her purse and be afraid. But, she said, you have to be curious about yourself, right? Not just curious about others, but why am I doing that? And she said, I've learned to recognize when I'm beginning to act out of my prejudices and then to cut that short and choose to behave in a different way. This, I think, is an invitation for us to be curious about others and to be curious about ourselves and our reactions so that we can just live deeply into this gift of life that Jesus has given us. Jesus sees past the labels, sees past all of it, sees right into who we are as people and invites us to do the same. And when we are able to do that, because Jesus is working through us, we get connected into that deep human community that God has gifted us with. And when we get connected into that, people have authority for us, we have authority for people, but really it's Jesus' love that brings that authority to us and the Holy Spirit which continues to coax us along into places of health and well-being so that we can welcome people into this journey we are on and trust that Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God are shaping us all together into the people who are beloved as we were created to be, who can see one another in that way and carry that gift along, this gift of love as we go. Amen.